Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am Krista Burns at the Nebraska Library Commission, your host. Um, Encompass Live is the Library Commission's weekly online event uh, where we cover commission activities and any library topics that may be of interest to Nebraska librarians. We do these sessions um, free. They are done every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time for about an hour or however long it lasts. Um, and they are recorded, so if you're unable to listen to a live session, you are able to listen to all the archive recordings of all the sessions that we've done previously. Um, we do a mixture of different things here, presentations, interviews, web tours, little mini training sessions, whatever um, we think would be of interest, as I said. And um, we have commission staff that do presentations, and we do have guest speakers, as we have today. <laughs> um, today we are doing a... Uh, wrap up, I don't know what you want to call it, the best of ALA 2010. Uh, Jessica Chamberlain, who is our uh, Nebraska Regional Library System Administrator for the Northeast Library System, will be taking us through what uh, she saw and attended at ALA this year in DC. So uh, go ahead, take it away, Jessica. All right, thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I, I, like Krista said, this is just kind of a wrap-up, a, a best of what I got out of ALA. And um, in this kind of setting, it's hard to have a, a good discussion, um, too much back and forth. Uh, but I would love to, if anyone was there, I would love for you to chime in at any time if there's something that you want to add or that you saw that you want to share with everyone. I think that would be just great. Um, we would really add a lot to the presentation, so please feel free to do that. Um, this was my first time at ALA, uh, my first time at any national conference, um, and I have to say, if you've never gone, it is a bit overwhelming. Uh, there is a lot uh, to see when you first get there and sign up. They give you a program directory that is just a little under 370 pages long. So it's really quite um, a lot to absorb and see all at the same time. Um, I believe I heard that this year there was um, about 30,000 librarians there. And, um, wow, really? That, that is so a very a large one then, definitely. I've been, when there have been like 20, 25,000, um, and they basically take over a whole city. Yeah. True. <laughs> yes, we do. And um, it was quite funny to walk around Washington, D.C., and you could just pick the librarians out. I mean, we are easy to spot. So, but it was a lot of fun because there were just really, you know, librarians everywhere and, and a lot of people that share our same passions and same interests and, you know, same commitment to providing quality library service to everyone. So, um, so a few of the things I wanted to kind of highlight what I really thought was um, awesome about the conference. The first thing that I really loved was authors. There were authors everywhere. So I put on this uh, screen, these were just some of the authors that were there. Um, the opening session was Toni Morrison. Um, she was amazing. She was a fantastic speaker. She stayed afterwards for about an hour and a half to two hours signing autographs. And um, she was just really impressive. And then quite on the opposite end of the spectrum, then the closing session speaker was Amy Sedaris, who was uh, very funny, very entertaining, and uh, she made some crafts for us during her speech, and that was quite funny. Um, so this is just kind of a list, and um, I, I went and saw as many authors as I could, um, because that's something that just really that I enjoy. Here's Juno Diaz, who won, uh, I believe it was the National Book Award um, for Drown, um, and uh, so he was there. And we also got to go to the Caldecott and Newberry Banquet, which they have every year. And of course, this year's winners uh, for the Caldecott was Jerry Pinckney, and that's him way up there, if you can see. And um, if you know anything about him, his story is just incredible. He um, has gotten the Caldecott honor five times, but um, has finally won the actual, the top honor of the Caldecott uh, Award this year. So he was very gracious. And then Rebecca Stead was there as well, who won the Newberry this year for her first novel. Um, so she was also a very good speaker. Uh, they also had uh, what they called Live at Your Library Reading Stage. This was down in the exhibit hall. And there were all kinds of authors that would come and talk or do readings from their books. And it was just down in the exhibit hall. You can see they put it right in front of the men's restroom. 
and um, and then afterwards the authors would go um, to a publisher's booth and sign their books. So that was interesting to see too, because you could just stop by for a minute and hear someone speak and go on your way. Um, that's uh, Jim Brewer. From a lot of people know him from Saturday Night Live. Uh, he was there um, at a publisher's booth signing. And then the auditorium speaker series. I put this slide in. It's not a great picture. Uh, but just to give you the scope of how, how big of a scale some of these events are, this was uh, Sir Salman Rushdie, and he was there talking a lot about his children's books uh, that he's written for his sons. And um, so this is how you can see the, uh, just the size of the room. And of course, I always sat in the back because then you could get in line to get your autograph faster. <laughs> it's a little <laughs> trick I learned after being there for a couple of days. <laughs> Very good tip, definitely. I always try and be up yes. front so I can see what's going on. <laughs> yes, but if you want to get in line, you've got to sit at the very back. Um, so, but so he was also an excellent speaker. And then, of course, every child's favorite, Max and Ruby. Here is the author of Max and Ruby, Rosemary Wells, uh, down at a publisher's booth. And again, not a great picture, but just to give you an idea how this is the exhibit hall downstairs. It was just packed with librarians and authors and vendors and salespeople just from top to bottom. And then there's the infamous Nancy Pearl, who was also one of the auditorium speakers series uh, speakers, um, but I just ran into her outside. <laughs> so and then there's Amy Sedaris, who was the closing session speaker. So then a little bit about the exhibits. I did not expect the exhibits to be um, as good as they were. There were over 1,500 booths um, of different products and services, and vendors. If it even remotely belonged in a library, it was there in the exhibit hall. And um, I thought it would be interesting to see the exhibits, but I, I really actually learned a lot in the exhibits about what kind of products and services are available that I didn't know about. Um, and the, the vendors were not pushy. It wasn't a big sales pitch. It was you know just informational, so it was actually a really valuable part of the conference that I didn't expect to be to be like that. So here's just a shot of the exhibit floor. Um, they had all, all the aisles numbered and as you can see a lot of the vendors had really colorful and interesting displays so you could you know get a good idea of what they had to offer. And then um, this I just thought was hilarious because Brodart has this library vending machine uh, but they didn't do anything to make it look like a library vending machine other than put books in what normally where candy bars would go. So Okay, interesting. In <laughs> yes, I thought you could, you could have done a little better on that, but anyway. Um, and then President Obama was there. Unfortunately, he was just a cardboard cutout. But, uh, but the exhibits really were quite interesting, and a lot of the vendors were very generous giving out, you know, copies of free books, um, some advanced reader copies, some paperback copies of the actual book, um, you know, lots of freebies and bags and pens and all that kind of stuff to entice you to come. And every vendor also to try to get you to come and get on their mailing list was, everybody was giving away an iPad. So that was the hot thing to try to get this year. But of course, the main thing um, at ALA is, of course, the programs, um, and that's that's mainly why we go. Uh, lots and lots of workshops. There were literally hundreds of programs that you could go to at any one time. I mean, there were 20 and 30 different things going on at any particular time slot. So it was one of those situations where there are so many good things that you know in order to see one good thing you're giving up on seeing five other good things that are happening at the same time. So it was really hard to pick what programs to go see and you, you don't always know what's going to really relate to you and what you see until you've actually been in it. And, um, so but this is just a shot of inside the Washington DC Convention Center. Um, uh, you know, librarians walking around and the signs and everything what it looked like. So, um, so now I just wanted to highlight a few of the things that I got the most out of uh, workshop-wise. And uh, the first thing was I went to a couple of different workshops on eBooks. This is something that I think is very interesting and just really something that the library world, we need to be a part of this discussion. There's a big revolution going on out there. Um, they're estimating that by 2012, ebooks will be 20% of the book market. One in five books that is sold will be a digital book. And that's huge. That's a huge increase from where it is now and, and from where it was last year. 
And, you know, this is going to have an impact on our libraries, and we really need to be a part of what's going on out there with this and find where our libraries can fit in this new, um, this new world. So the first Definitely. one that... Um, Jessica, I was yeah. just going to say that I, that's an interesting statistic when um, you sometimes see lots of new stories and articles about how ebooks will just are the death of um, traditional paper books. But twenty yeah. percent is not the death of anything. It's just it's going to be a part of it, and you'll have to yeah work it in. Right, especially with the technology at the level that it is now, um, you can't do picture books. Um, on e-reader devices, uh, you know, there are things that you can do online on your computer or laptop, but nothing that's as mobile as what e-books are for adults. So graphic novels, things that are graphic heavy, like picture books, um, comic books, are not, um, you know, there's a lot more technology has to evolve before those are going to be in danger of going away. Um, but on the other hand, 2012 is only two years away, a year and a half away. So if that's going to be 20% by 2012, what will it be by 2015? You know, what are we going to see in five years down the line? So I don't think it's going to be the death of print, but, um, but it's definitely going to be a part of it. And libraries need to find out, we need to find out where we fit in that world. And, and some of that will depend on where, you know, your particular library is in the community. Uh, a small rural po uh, population that has an aging population may not be nearly as affected uh, by this as Omaha or Lincoln, where there's lots of college students and younger people that, you know, are adopting this technology much faster. So um, uh, this, uh, Doug Olin, who presented this workshop, you know, was asking the question, why now? Because honestly, ebooks have been around since the mid to late 90s, but nobody wanted them. Um, but now there's finally consumer-driven demand for them. The Kindle, when that came out, that really appealed to a lot of, uh, you know, middle-aged adults, and, and that was really appealing. Now that the iPad is out, if the iBooks app makes eBooks cool for younger people, for teens and 20-somethings, and so people actually finally want them, and that's what's really driving uh, this uh, rise in people wanting these. So there are different types of ways to get eBooks. Um, of course, there's the institutional licensed products like Overdrive in that library, and um, Nebraska actually has, I'm going to go out to the Nebraska um, Overdrive website real quick. Uh, we have actually a lot of libraries that are participating in the Nebraska Overdrive product or project. So as I And I know that there are new ones joining all the time, too. There are, and Overdrive used to just be audiobooks, but they are now including ebooks. They have about 170 ebooks that are available, which I think is wonderful. I think it's just really an important thing for us to be a part of. Um, but here is the uh, Overdrive's list of compatible ebook de devices. And you can see you can use it on your desktop, your Windows computer, your Mac, the Barnes & Noble Nook, the Sony Reader. But down here, the two most popular e-readers are the Kindle and the iPad, and those two don't work. So, so Overdrive is great, but it's not going to be a competitor for, you know, for these giants, for Kindle and iPad. Um, I read an article by Aaron Schmidt in Library Journal, uh, the J July 2010 Library Journal. Um, it was called Services Before Content, and he talked a lot about how we need to, libraries need to stop focusing on giving away free content and do something different because we're never going to compete with the Kindle and the iPad and, and the convenience of these kinds of services. And I thought he made an interesting point because um, a sort of Overdrive and NetLibrary are wonderful services. They work really well for library models. But they're not exactly the most user-friendly um, websites. They take some, whoops, now I have to go back to the beginning. Uh, they take some time to learn, and you have to download things, and, you know, it's just not the easiest thing to, to do. So I thought I made some good points with that. Yeah, it's interesting to see when you are looking at the, <clears throat> the ones that are and aren't compatible with OverDrive. You kind of also get the idea, and I've had this before because we work with, I do the Net Library group here um, for the state, of who will is willing to think about working with libraries and who isn't. Amazon and Apple have always been, nah, 
we're doing our own thing, and if you guys can figure it out, fine. If not, we're not going to do anything special. But Sony readers, yeah. they went to OCLC and to Overdrive and said, we want to work with libraries. We know that's a great market. And now Barnes & Noble's, mm -hmm. you know, their Nook reader. Um, it's interesting <laughs> of who is scra is on their side is reaching out to the library market and who isn't. Yes, and uh, obviously Amazon and Apple don't need us. You know, they're making huge profits. They don't need the library market, and so they're never going to be driven to try to work with us because they don't need to. Um, and just this morning I heard that Barnes & Noble is for sale because they are not making enough money, and the Nook is not making the money that they thought it would, and um, so they're actually the company is up for sale. So. Oh, really? Um, I had not seen that yet. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I heard that just this morning on the way to work. Um, so the next one I went to was about how do you evaluate ebooks if you do have them in your library, if you're using them, you know, once we've started using uh, ebooks, how do we evaluate them? Um, so three different people came and talked about how their library was trying to um, evaluate their use. Um, the Westchester Library System in New York, uh, they found that, and they have Overdrive. They found that the classics were actually the most used ebooks that they had um, when they had ebooks that allowed multiple users. And um, then they found that New York Times bestseller were the most used ebooks that only allowed single users. So I don't know why the discrepancy of the two, um, but that, that is what they found. And then they also use something called Tumble Books, if you're familiar with that. Um, if you're not, I encourage you to check out the website. It's a really cute web program. Um, that you can buy for your library, and it's like interactive picture books, kind of like how Scholastic and Weston Woods will animate their books into like a DVD format to watch. Tumble Books does a similar thing, um, but keeps it online. So you just stream it online, and there's no downloading, and, and they said for them it costs about 12 cents per title per year, which is a great deal, and it's really cute, and it does picture books and all that, but it's only for use on a desktop or laptop. It's not compatible with any kind of mobile device, so, um, but that's what they reported. And then Brigham Young University, um, they were trying to evaluate their collection, and they found that each year only about 20% of, of their collection circulated. Um, they know it's true for print, and what they could evaluate, they said they thought that seemed about true of ebooks too. So it didn't seem, that the format didn't seem to influence really how the book was circulating. It was about the same. Um, they said from, 20, or from 2000 to 2010, about half of their collection circulated. But that meant they spent $7 million on some books that no one read. And I was just floored by that. Uh, $7 million of books sitting on a shelf that no one wants has cracked the spine. I mean, that's just, in this kind of economy, that doesn't make sense. Um, if they, they talked about how if they had gone to the on-demand just-in-time purchasing, which I know um, like Omaha is doing with the Kindles and some other libraries around the country are doing, you know, the, they wait until the patron asks for it. When the patron asks for it, they then they download it and give it to them in a digital format. If they would have gone to some a model that was like that, it would have literally saved them millions of dollars. And I don't know a library in this country that would not like to save millions of dollars. So in that way, evaluating the use of ebooks really has a lot of potential to make a lot of sense for especially big libraries and academic libraries where the titles are expensive, they're sometimes very specific, and sometimes don't even get used once they are purchased. So, um, but he also said that it was hard for them to evaluate some of the ebooks that they got because they need better statistics and they need uh, better mark records for ebooks. And, and so he talked about how the vendors need to respond to, to that need for the library. Um, and then Christopher Warnock, who is the CEO and president of eBrary, um, said ebooks are worth it because they're the future, like it or not. Um, he was, he was very flip about the fact, and he actually angered several of the people in the crowd, and several people got up in the workshop and went to the microphone and, and you know, were really quite unhappy with the way that he said, you know, e-books are the future, digital is the future, the print is the past. And uh, he, he indicated personally that he loves print books and has a huge print book collection, but it really has no validity in the future. Um, he said print will always have a place. But from now on, ebooks have one too. 
So I thought that was an interesting way to put it. Um, are there, before I go on, are there any questions about ebooks or anybody want to chime in about, um, you know, their thoughts on the future of this or? If you have a question, feel free to type into the question section of your interface um, or just say, please unmute me if you have a microphone and I can do that too. Okay, well, I will go on then if no one has any questions. The next thing that I went to that I thought was very um, relevant to in Nebraska and to a lot of the libraries here is a, a workshop that was on the American Dream Starts at Your Library. And this is a Dollar General Literacy Foundation grant um, that gives away grants to public libraries who serve immigrant communities. The project overview is there on your screen. Um, if you want to read that, um, but basically they just really want to reach out to the library, the public library as a place for immigrants to go to um, get services, to become a part of our country, to become part of our communities. So three of the libraries that have got this grant, 75 libraries got grants in 2010, and three of them were there. Uh, Bentonville, Arkansas, which is of course the home of Walmart and a lot of immigrant communities that are there. They did something really neat with their $5,000 grant. They actually hosted the naturalization ceremony at the library. So they had the judge and all the officials and all of the people that had been in the citizenship class that were getting ready to be naturalized citizens come to the library and they actually did the official ceremony there. And the the uh, the library director was almost in tears about how wonderful this was for her library. They had a huge turnout. They got fantastic media coverage. They got great sound bites and comments from people. And here were these people who wanted so much to be a part of our country that they went through the rigorous process of naturalization. And there they were at their public library doing the ceremonies. And it was very touching. She had a lot of great pictures from it. And um, I just thought that was a really neat idea. And then, of course, after the ceremony, all the families, uh, the new citizens got care packages from the library about, you know, community resources and how to get a library card and all these wonderful things to, to give someone. So that was a really original idea, I thought. Bowling Green, Ohio, was the next uh, presenter. And they basically uh, upped their bookmobile service to immigrant populations. Uh, they had more summer reading programs. They bought bilingual materials. But the good point that I thought that she made, and this has been my experience working with immigrant communities, too, especially Hispanic immigrant communities, that often they feel uncomfortable coming into an official city building. Even if you have bilingual materials and you have lots of things there for them, they don't always know that they're welcome. So it's often most helpful to go out into their community where they already are to where they feel com uh, comfortable and let them know that they are welcome in your public library and that, that you do serve them and you want them to come and take advantage of what you have to offer. So sometimes it takes going out into their community first instead of waiting for them just to come to you. And I thought that she made a really good point of, of that by, by using their bookmobile to do that kind of service. And then the next uh, presenter was Carla Schaefer, who was the director of the Hooper Public Library. And um, she did a fantastic presentation. She'll actually be speaking at our um, Northeast Library System annual conference because I enjoyed her uh, speech so much. Um, but she began a bilingual collection. She used her library to create a welcoming atmosphere, um, but then found a lot of what Bowling Green found, that doing those things was not enough, and it was not bringing immigrants in. Uh, she had to go out into their community and let them know that they were welcome. So she had to reach out to them. And uh, she's lucky enough to be um, fluent in Spanish, so she has started an ESL program to immigrants in her community teaching English as a second language in hopes to then bring them into the library and let them know that they are welcome in her library. There is um, some, some great resources for librarians. If you have a lot of immigrants in your community and um, need some extra resources to help them, the um, American Dream Toolkit there, uh, AmericanDreamToolkit.org, is available online. It's about a 30-page uh, print and digital resource guide, 
and it's broken up into different sections like citizen materials, daily life, magazines, um, DVDs and CDs. So if you're looking for, and this primarily focuses on Spanish-speaking immigrants. So if uh, that's something that you're in need of, you can download that for free and just print it off or look at it online. But a lot of great resources in there. And then the next one is colorincolorado.org. And that's a bilingual site for families and educators um, of English language learners. So there's resources for librarians on there, and there's just a lot of great resources there, printable things, uh, downloadable things that you can use in your library. So I encourage you to check that out. And then the next one is the USCIS.gov, which is United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, which used to be the INS. So they have a lot of great citizenship resources if you have patrons that are wanting to get um, enrolled in the citizenship class or want citizenship you know, materials, study materials for the test, or information on their immigration status, uh, you can find a lot of that great information there. If you're interested in applying for this American Dream grant, the link is there um, at dollargeneral.com. And um, their literacy, they also have several other literacy grants there, too. So if you're not interested in this particular grant but um, are looking for other grant opportunities, Dollar General does actually have several literacy grants that they give out. They're usually in amounts of about $5,000, and um, you can apply for all of them in the same place. Is there any questions on the American Dream or Dollar General literacy before I go on? I'll pause just for a moment. I, this is Krista. I just want to say I, we thought that was very cool that Hooper got that grant. They, she was very, very honored and surprised by it. <laughs> yeah, and she really is a, is a wonderful, wonderful person. And um, she was the only library in all of Nebraska to get this grant also. So I thought that was interesting. Okay, well, I'll move on. The next thing that I thought was really relevant to um, what we do here in Nebraska was uh, a workshop called Numbers That Speak Volumes, Using Data to Make the Case for Rural Libraries. And um, using data, oh, that already sounds terrible. I mean, most librarians did not get into librarianship so that they could do math. That is not usually what our strong suit is. Uh, we're not statisticians. You know, that's just not, most for most of us, what our strong point is. So when it comes around time to do statistics and to do reports and budgets and all that, sometimes it's a very begrudging task, I know. Um, but I, I thought it was very interesting. The presenters of this workshop really talked about using numbers to tell a story. And stories are something that librarians usually are good at. And so they really just encouraged to make sure that when you're using numbers and having to do reports and things, Make sure that you're using, you're, you're framing your information so that it tells a story. Your information should be relevant to your audience. It should be in terms that they understand. And, and it's also helpful to give them something to compare it to. If you had 25 kids in your summer reading program this year, and you say that very excitedly to your city council person, that you, they may know that that's good because you sound excited about it, but they, they may not have any frame of reference for that information. So make sure you always compare it to something else. Either compare it to how many kids you had last year to show that you're growing, or compare it to how many kids were in swimming lessons at the city pool. Compare it to how many kids played summer baseball at your city organization. You know, make sure that they can compare it to something else that will make sense to them. So after they talked about that, then they, they threw out all of these wonderful places to get information. Um, and one of them is, and I'm going to run through quite a few of those just to give you some examples of where you can find good information and good statistics, um, not only to help you tell your story and to frame your story and give comparison, comparison statistics, but also so that um, a lot of this information is helpful when you're filling out grants and you need to find statistical information for grants. So I'm going to go through quite a few sources of that now. The first one is the Annie E. Casey Foundation and their Kids Count Data Center. Uh, they do a lot of information on children and literacy, children and poverty. You can see from the screenshot that you can get data by state, data comparing different states and cities. 
So a lot of really wonderful information on this website. And every state has a Kids Count um, initiative. So in Nebraska, that initiative is called Voices for Children. And this is a screenshot of their county data page. And if you click on any one of the counties, um, you know, if you were to click on Custer County or Nance County, it will bring up this wonderful fact sheet that gives you all kinds of information, like how many kids in your county are in early childhood um, Head Start. How many births did you have? How many Medicaid eligible children do you have? How many low birth weight, out of wedlock births, infant deaths? Uh, you know, not very cheery statistics always, but sometimes when you're working for grants, um, you need to know this kind of information. Uh, the percent of children in poverty in your county. So this can be very, very helpful information. The next is the American Library Association. And obviously they are a good source of information for library information. Um, but I didn't realize how much they had on their website on, in terms of research and statistics. So I put a big red arrow by the Research and Statistics tab on their home page. And especially in this, I encourage you to look at some of the Return on Investment Studies, or ROI studies that they're called sometimes. Because typically they find that for every dollar that's given to a library, it returns a $4 value to the community. And there are lots of um, different studies in there, but typically this is what they find. So there's no better argument for a city council to Im uh, improve your budget or if you're going for increased funding for something. There's no better argument than to say the library is a good investment. You give me a dollar, I will give you back four. That beats any money market account, That be, especially in this economy, that beats any kind of return you're going to get from any other kind of investment. So it's a really powerful argument for people with money to invest in libraries. The next is the IMLS, um, or Institute of Museum and Library uh, Services, their in Internet Impact Study that was released earlier this year. There is a little um, snippet from an American Libraries Magazine article there that came out in April. But this is just a lot of great information, and it kind of proves what we already know, that people use the library to use the computer. And we kind of know that anecdotally, but here is the hard facts. Here are the hard statistics that show um, that one in three people use the library um, to access the Internet. So it's also a very powerful argument that the libraries need to keep current. We need to keep up with broadband. We need to keep up with modern technology uh, when it comes to our internet access. We need to have enough internet access for all of our patrons. Because if we don't, we are disservicing 33% of our population. So it's just a very good backing statistics for those kind of arguments if you need to update your computers, upgrade your software, um, or get more machines. The Nebraska Library Commission is, of course, also another good source of information. And um, here is the link to their library data services page. Um, we all know that Nebraska libraries have to fill out that wonderful survey every year. And so, of course, everything that you answer on that survey is made available then um, on this page. So um, you can um, access those files here. At the very bottom, there's the public library statistical files to download. So you can access them that way and get a nice Excel spreadsheet. They also have some great um, color printouts of uh, facts of Nebraska. Um, their library statistic sheet, like 86% of Nebraska public libraries provide free internet access to the public. And then they did a really fun thing with um, comparing the visits to public libraries to visits to Memorial Stadium. And there were 8,606,616 visits to Nebraska public libraries in the fiscal year 2008. And that was enough to fill Memorial Stadium 106 times. And I just love that statistic. I think that's great. Yeah, so that's part I, of making it personal to um, us. <laughs> really gets yeah. people's attention. Yes, and so my question is, there are all these Husker shirts walking all the way around Nebraska, and hats and sweatshirts and shoes. Where's our library shirts? I don't see near as many library shirts as I do Husker shirts, and we should have them. 
Absolutely. So, <laughs> that's right, because way more people go to the library than ever go to a Husker game. Um, but so lots and lots of great library information from Nebraska, and I know that the Commission will be happy to help you find things, as will your regional library systems, if there is information that you want to find that you're having a hard time getting to, we will help get you there. Um, but if you're interested in what other states are doing, maybe you live in an area that borders one of the other states um, around Nebraska, Library Research Service is a great website and um, will link you to other state libraries information. Like if you click on Nebraska data, it will take you right to the Nebraska Library Commission's Library Services data page, which we just looked at. So if you want to find similar information from other states around South Dakota or Iowa, uh, you can easily find them here from this website. I thought that was really interesting. Also, the Bureau of Labor Statistics is a really great place to get um, statistics also. If you're going for a grant and maybe need to know unemployment rates, or other kind of labor uh, issues in your area, uh, this is a really great place to go. The National Center for Education Statistics is obviously a place for education statistics, but it is the primary federal entity for collecting and analyzing data related to education. So if you're going for a grant or need information about education in your county or your city or your region, uh, this is a wonderful place to go, and they have some really nice tools on there, some data tools and tables and things that you can do. Um, so this is another really great place to go. The Pew Internet and American Life Project is something that's been going on since 2000, and uh, they do lots of great studies all the time about all sorts of interesting things. And um, a lot of times when people quote random facts, a lot of times they come from the Pew Foundation, so they do a lot of research and, um, you know, a sample uh, of a statistic that they would give you would be that 78% uh, of adults are Internet users and 65% of adults have home broadband connections. So this is also a good thing to argue that if 65% of adults in your area do not have home broadband connections, it gives an even stronger argument for why the library needs to have a good broadband connection because you need to bring all those adults that don't have it need to have a place to access that. So just more and more good statistics. So this is a little bit more about what I talked about at the beginning, just using numbers to tell your story. And most importantly, you need to keep it simple. You know, plan out what you're trying to find out at the beginning and then go and, and collect that information. Think about what you want to know first before you go hunting for statistics because all of these websites that I gave you, I mean, it can really be overwhelming with the amount of information that's out there. So in order to not get overwhelmed, try to focus on what it is that one thing that you want to know. And then think like your audience, you know, make sure that you put them in context for your audience like the Memorial Stadium attendance for Nebraskans because that's something that's very close to all of us and, you know, that's something that we understand. Make sure that you put your information then in something that your city council or your library director will be able to understand and have a frame of reference. And then make it pretty because people do good with pictures and visual representations. So whenever possible, make a chart or a diagram, you know, a pie graph something that will visually tell your story as well because that will just strengthen the message that you're trying to get across. Did anyone have any questions about statistics or any of those websites or have a great place that you get stats that you'd like to toss out there to everyone else so that they know another good uh, resource for st statistics? Go ahead and type into your questions if you want. Um, while we're just waiting on that. I just wanted to say there were a lot of URLs, a lot of websites that Jessica showed there. And as usual with our recordings, when we put up the recording of this session, we will have links to all of those as well. So um, probably should mention this really. You don't have to try and scribble them all down now. We'll have them all linked out from the recording session. Thank you for saying that, Krista. I, I forgot to mention that earlier. That's a great thing to know, yes. So don't scribble furiously. Um, all right, well, the last thing I wanted to talk about then was advocacy, because it was a huge, huge message. And um, the past, the, this past year's uh, ALA president, Camille Aliri, that was really her, um, really her project was frontline advocacy. 
So I left it to last because it's something that we could talk about forever and ever. Um, you know, it's really something that th there's just a lot of great information and a lot of great discussion going around about advocacy. So, you know, I, this is just a little what is it? it? It's, you know, really us trying to get support for libraries. And it means that we have to tell our story and tell it compellingly so that the people, the powers that be, know that we are valuable, that we're important to the community, and that we need their support. We will not survive if we don't continue to get the support of the communities where our libraries are. So who should see an advocate? And this is what I think is really, really important. Everyone that comes in and out of the library doors is a potential advocate for the library, especially library staff, board members, and volunteers. Those uh, people, all of those people should know the library's message. They should know your mission. They should know your statistics. They should know, and now in the large library, no, not every volunteer is going to know everything there is to know about a large library, but, but those volunteers should be educated on what the library is doing, and the board members should be advocates out in the communities and the businesses that they work in and the businesses that they go to do. Because the librarians alone, especially in a small library, a librarian cannot do it all. They can't be the one and only advocate for the library in their community. So everyone that's involved with your library, I encourage you to talk to them, make sure that they know your information, they know your message, and that they're promoting use of the library whenever they can. Even if it's in the line at the grocery store and they see a young child in front of them and say, hey, and talk to their mom. Hey, did you know that the library has story time? And you know, really just keep it in conversation, keep it in the forefront of people's minds. Um, so how do you successfully tell your library story? That's going to be different for every library and every person. Uh, there's lots and lots of ways to do this. Um, I've included, I said, see the small but powerful guide to winning big support for your rural library. And I've got the URL for that coming up here in a minute. Another great place to get information is the Advocacy Clearinghouse from American Library Association's website, and here's the URL for that. You can get lots of great resources here, and again, more statistics, like these quotable facts for America's libraries that you see on the bottom there. It's this cute little brochure that you can print out either as a Word document or this adorable little PDF, and it's just tiny when you print it out. It's just you know meant to fit in your pocket. It kind of folds up. But it's got great statistics uh, just to hand out to people like, you know, there are more libraries in America than there are McDonald's, which I actually was shocked to know that. Um, so some great resources there. Here's that small but powerful guide. And it just has just a ton, a ton of uh, ideas, samples, you know, what's worked for other people in the past, a lot of anecdotal stories in it. Uh, just very short little blurbs about what people have done in their library to, to make it work and to, to make it all fit together and to get their community support. Uh, Jessica, speaking of advocacy, I don't know, did you hear about the new uh, free online advocacy training program that ALA slash PLA just uh, made available? No, I don't think I have. Yeah, there's, um, it was just announced uh, just earlier this month, um, July. Yeah, <laughs> last month. Okay. Um, there's a course, there's an online, well, there's an in-person course called Turning the Page that the Public Library Association created with money from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It was originally to support their grant programs that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation did for libraries. Um, it was a two-day set um, meeting that you could go to. Um, it was done just for some grantees and then also as part of a couple of PLAs. They did it as well. Um, and... They have now decided with, um, I guess, extra funding from Gates that any ALA member can um, take this. They have made an online version of it. It was an in-person session. Um, now they have an on, there's an online com component as well, which is all the different modules, all the different sessions you would attend in person available online. And, um, Fantastic. And it's free to ALA members. You can just go, if you just look up Turning the Page and online um, or PLA, you'll find the website. I'll include the link to the information about it when we put up the links to your session. Um, okay. And, um, and I can go, sorry. No, and I can go back here to this great. slide. Yeah, there are also I, other advocacy web, webinars and more here in this advocacy courses online. If you can see on the right-hand side of the uh, ALA's 
Advocacy Clearinghouse website right here. So there's some, some great things available there as well. Yeah, it definitely is something all libraries need to be, you know, thinking about, and this free training is great, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it takes, it in total to do all of it, it might take five or six hours to do all the sessions, but. Okay. All totally online. Interesting. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that, Krista. Yeah. Um, can you uh, back up one slide? Someone wanted to see the previous slide. Yeah, just that one. Sure. And, um. And this is a great resource that focuses on rural libraries, native and tribal libraries. So, you know, all sorts of small libraries that might be out there in the community, especially in Nebraska. Uh, we do have a comment um, about the ALA conference that maybe you could just mention a little what you thought of the um, various groups that meet during the meetings, the, pub, the different constituents, the round tables, the committees, those kind of things, the school librarians, how they each have their um, groups or meetings. Did you um, attend or see any of that kind of I stuff? Went, I went to a new members round table um, event uh, called uh, Conference 101 since this was my first conference. So, um, I did do that, but yeah, there are a lot of great sections um, and divisions. And part of the workshops, they do different tracks. So if you're particularly interested in administration and management or children's services or school libraries, they do a lot of things and they kind of sort it out that way so that you can go to things that will be the most relevant to what you're trying to learn about. And, um, but they are, there are lots of section meetings, uh, divisions, uh, roundtables. There's, uh, there's pre I mean, pretty much any interest group that you might want to be a part of. ALA has a subdivision or something like that for you. And that is a great time to uh, connect with other people who do what you do across the country. Yeah, I found the tracks very useful myself because, as you said at the beginning, ALA is huge and it can be very overwhelming when you get that fat book of all of the sessions that are going to be available in those few days um, that you can very easily use either the tracks or the particular section you might be interested in or a member of to focus on what you would attend out of all those things that are available. Yes, it is very helpful. I believe there were 10 learning tracks this year. So. Oh, nice. Yeah, and then they all had subtracks, you know, subdivisions within that to make it more specific if you were really interested in, um, you know, collection management or human resources, things like that. Any other questions? No, we just have a comment from one of our librarians, Laura at Stanton Public Library, saying she has not had the opportunity to attend ALA. Thank you for bringing it to life for her. <laughs> no problem. So I think you can bump to the your final slide there for your contact info. Okay. Yeah. Um, does anybody have any other questions or comments? Go ahead and type them in or ask me to unmute you and we can get those in at the end here. Well, I don't see anything new. <laughs> okay. Well, I really appreciate getting the opportunity to share my experience. Uh, this has really been great for me. I had such a wonderful time there. So, um, and thank you uh, for letting me do the session. Absolutely, it's definitely a good idea, and we've. Um, it's given us a good idea now that we are going to probably do a similar thing um, to this. Uh, this best of ALA um, for our NLA conference in October. We said, why don't we oh, great. do that? So um, look forward to that. We'll figure out how we might want to get some people to show up and talk about how, what they experienced at NLA at our Nebraska NLA NEMA conference in Grand Island. And um, so, yeah, borrow, borrow, steal your idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's all yours. Yeah. All right, well, I think we will wrap it up then. Thank you very much, Jessica. Definitely very good information. I also did not get to go to ALA this year. I don't go all the time. So it's good to hear what was going on um, and, and see how it all went down there. Um, yeah.
So we will wrap it up for this morning um, and just invite you to join us next week for Encompass Live. Our topic will be RSS Feed Me. Uh, Michael Sowers, the Technology Innovation Librarian here at the Library Commission, will give, me, give a session on um, how you can use RSS feeds to keep up on any, anything that's going on um, in blogs and emails and websites and give you a little introduction to that. So hope you bring it, hope you'll join us next Wednesday at 10 a.m. Central Time for that. So thank you very much for attending. Bye-bye.